October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast, episode number 49, The Eastern Question. Last time, we talked about the daily controversy in the church, that senseless feud over Daniel 8 that pitted traditionalists like Stephen Haskell and Judson Washburn against more open-minded Adventists like A.G. Daniels and W.W. Prescott. The whole affair nearly ran Prescott out of the church. Even when Ellen White shut down the argument, resentment lingered until, in 1931, Willie White was still reassuring members that Prescott wasn't a heretic. Sigh. And now, most Adventists agree with Prescott, so when you see him someday, buy him a bottle of root beer and say, thanks, mate. And as usual, this episode of the Adventist History Podcast is sponsored by The Haystack. The Haystack is a voice for young adults in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that produces articles, music, reviews, videos, and more. So to check them out, go to thehaystack.org. The Haystack, life, culture, theology. And pigeons. They sell pigeons. Ugly, ugly pigeons. Anyways, let's leave the pigeons alone because now it's time to join our Seventh-day Adventist friends at the 1913 General Conference session. We are just in time because John Loughborough wants to celebrate a birthday. So the delegates listen to reports from all over the world. When Loughborough stands up to speak, he is 81 years old. This is what he says. Quote, I want to tell you about the birth of a little child. You know, old folks are all interested in little children. This was one that was born 50 years ago this very day. May 21st, 1863. And I think it was about this hour. End quote. I'm just going to stop Loughborough there because these stories can go on and on and on and on. That baby, to cut to the chase, was the general conference. Surprise! Everyone had to be smiling, though, when Loughborough reminded people how the first official general conference session only had 20 delegates from seven states in the United States. And how at the first session, Willie White was just this eight-year-old boy bringing water for the delegates. Or how the delegates agonized over covering a $160 debt. And now Loughborough is sitting there in 1913 listening to 356 delegates talk about 75 baptisms in a village in Africa or a health food factory in Sweden. In this first decade, since the General Conference was formed way back in 1863, the believers managed $176,000 in tithe, which is incredible. It is incredible. But in the last decade of these first 50 years, the believers gave over $11 million in tithe. Let me just put it another way for you numbers nerds. Basically, in the first 50 years of the organized Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the first 50 years, 66% of all giving happened in the last 10 years. So this church is just taking off. And Loughborough strolled down memory lane, kicked off this old-timer remembering party. I just picture them at a dirty diner making off-color jokes to the waitress who, of course, knows them all by name by now. We're talking about Bordeaux, we're talking about Loughborough, we're talking about Haskell, and they're sitting there drinking their fake coffee, talking about how when they were young, they had to cut down trees with their teeth and make copies of the Bible themselves and that sort of stuff. Well, Augustin Bordeaux did say he remembered when he could count all of the church's pastors on one hand. And Loughborough did recall that first time he met Ellen White. 30 minutes after first meeting her, people were whispering to themselves that she was in vision. She's in vision. Vision? What's that? Loughborough asked. He was startled. I mean, what, what kind of group had he just joined? Loughborough also remembered a time when he declared that Adventists would someday take their message around the world. 
people warned him that if they took their message around the world, the cultural differences would eventually cause the worldwide church to split up. It couldn't be done. And here, in 1913, Loughborough is laughing. Well, also at that 1913 General Conference session, Conradi, leader of the work in Europe, is present giving a report. And he says that there are Adventists meeting from Iceland to eastern Russia and from Africa to Uzbekistan. He's responsible, he told them, for a territory 8,000 miles from west to east and 6,000 miles from north to south. And in that gigantic box in his territory were half a billion people. And to reach those half a billion people, there were 179 pastors. Half a billion people. And 27,000 members among those half a billion people. I mean, how is this possible? How did we travel 50 years so fast? How did we go from 5,000 members in 1863 to 125,000 50 years later? Arthur G. Daniels, General Conference President, of course, joked that the church would have to start aiming for the North and South Poles next. Now, one of the great, boring achievements of the General Conference session in 1913 was approving a new organizational level in the church division conferences. So now you had a a local church, and then you had a state conference, like Iowa or Michigan. And then on top of that, those conferences formed into groups called a union conference, and now these union conferences um, are underneath a division conference. So to give you an example of a division, well, Conradi had pioneered this in Europe, and So it was the European division, and underneath that were all these unions, and underneath the unions were the conferences, and underneath the conferences were the local churches. So that gives you a rough idea about the scale we're talking about here. It's really interesting, because Conradi had pioneered this in Europe, and now the rest of the church was beginning to adopt it, just like the Australians had pioneered unions before exporting those to the rest of the church. So really... The, the, the global nature of the Seventh-day Adventist church is kind of like a laboratory where new ideas, new structures, new ways of doing things can be worked out, can be practiced, can be put to use, and, and when some innovation happens, then it can be exported and adopted by the rest of the church. So it's pretty cool. And with this adoption of divisions, we now have the modern structure of the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is what we have today. We have the local churches, the state conferences or regional conferences. We have the the unions. We have the divisions and, of course, the general conference. All right, so just to put this in perspective and in one more way, we could say that state conferences were enough for 40 years until unions were needed. Okay? Unions lasted 10 years before we needed yet another layer of church organization which is good because this new level of organization, these divisions, are about to be put under a stress test. Now, looking back, we can detect the seeds of bitter herbs beginning to grow. Conradi noted in his report that some of the young European men under his division were leaving to go to other places for school. Why would you want to leave Europe, you ask? They have great crepes and gelato. Well, the reason why they were leaving is because they wanted to avoid mandatory military service, which has always been a bit of a thorny issue in the church. So on March 1st, 1913, two months before the general conference session, Germany began calling up 100,000 young men into the army in the largest military spending bill in German history. It was a one-time expense of nearly 1 billion gold marks on top of the 600 million mark annual military budget, which was almost as much as Britain, 
and France's military budgets combined. Well, of course, Germany can't make this move without her neighbors following suit, which France did a week later with what they call the three-year law, which lengthened already mandatory military service from two years to three years. And so the effect of this, by keeping people in the army one year longer, would be that the army would build up. It'd be a little bit smaller than the German army, but only by 1916, because the law did not apply to those who were presently serving. So, so that year's recruitment began a three-year mandatory service. So by the time you had uh, people in the army for three years rather than just two, it would be 1916. And so they wouldn't quite match up to the Germans at this rate until, well, looking back, until it was too late. And a week after France did this, Russia joined in by expanding their army to a million and a half men. Why? Because Russia. It's just how we do things in Russia. All of this spooked Adventist young men in Europe, of course. You didn't have to be a genius to realize this likely wasn't going to end well. Adventists in America had a long history of refusing to fight in a war, beginning with the Civil War, and their government protected their status as conscientious objectors. European governments? Well, England would content herself with merely imprisoning some Adventists during World War I. To object to military service in Germany was life-threatening. As the conflict loomed, Conradi and the European division would find themselves cut off from the General Conference in America. So this was a real test on whether this division strategy worked. If left on its own, could it manage the affairs of the church in Europe? And so Conradi, during the war, would essentially function as General Conference president to the believers in Europe during the war. Anyways, we'll get to the war a little bit later. Because under the specter of this coming conflict, the real General Conference president, Arthur G. Daniels, went on a world tour. It was kind of his thing. He crossed the Atlantic on the British luxury liner Lusitania. That name sounds familiar. It should, because it was the sinking of the Lusitania that eventually helped bring America into World War I. Daniels, of course, made it safely to England, where he met with pretty much every Adventist leader there, every Adventist worker there. He traveled on to Istanbul and visited the 4,000 Adventists in Russia, where he believed he was under surveillance by the secret police. Thankfully, they didn't catch him preaching, or else he might have been in trouble, because in Russia you needed a license to preach, which would have made him like the James Bond of Adventist preachers. Except it's not a license to kill, it's a license to preach. You get it, you get it. Anyways, turning west a few years later, Daniels goes on another tour, this time a 15-month tour of the world that would culminate in the first meeting of the European division in Germany, the first official meeting. So that would put him in Germany in 1915. Now, if you know your history well, you'll know what's about to happen. To the rest of you, yeah, I'm sure he'll make it. Totally, he'll be fine. What could... What could be going wrong in the world in 1915 in Germany? Nah, nothing. I'm sure he'll make it. Daniels and his wife Mary embarked on a train ride across the country from headquarters in D.C. They were heading out to San Francisco to sail west. Now, one of the stops Daniels made was to Ellen White, whose health was not doing so well. Daniels described their meeting in one phrase, quote, we talked over old times, end quote. From there, he headed for Hawaii. Church members there love Daniels. I mean, how could you not be happy if you're in Hawaii? I mean, don't you just love everybody in Hawaii? Anyways, they, they love Daniels. He met with them every single night of his time there in meetings and, and, and prayer meetings and teaching and, and all of that stuff. They got him to teach Sabbath school on Sabbath, then preach for church. Then in the early afternoon, they brought Daniels to prison to speak to 200 inmates. And then that evening, he spoke to the youth as well. So a busy trip for Daniels. Busy trip. Then it was time to jump on another ship, 
for a 3,000-mile journey to Fiji and another 1,600 miles to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, Daniels visited Hobbiton, a set from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, voted the only thing worth seeing in New Zealand 100 years in a row. I'm kidding. I love you, Kiwis. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Daniels loved New Zealand, though. He remembered how it was 28 years ago that he had first set foot there as a missionary, an unknown missionary. Now, that trip had changed his life, transforming him from this preacher kid in Iowa into bona fide leadership material. And when he got off the boat back then, he was one of the crowd. Now crowds gathered to hear him, to greet him coming off the ship. His first stop was to the home of Edward Hare, the first convert to Adventism in New Zealand, which we talked about way back in episode 37. He traveled across New Zealand from north to south, spending an 18 days touring the country, visiting with many old friends. He wrote home to Willie to tell him of how well Sister So-and-So is aging and how many kids this other guy has had since they last saw each other and, and so on. It was more of a family reunion than the boss coming to town. When Daniels crossed over to Australia, the believers there wrapped him up in meetings every single day, just like Hawaii. Knowing that Adventists back home were starving for news of his trip, Daniels apologized for not writing as often as he wanted, but he said, When you have traveled 8,000 miles, preached 150 sermons, given 30 Bible studies, visited 80 families, and attended 50 meetings, writing regularly is kind of hard to fit into your schedule. Daniels then planned to go to Japan and China, but report of the German naval raid on Fanning Island set chills in the region. The Germans had flown a French flag as they approached the British island. By the time the defenders realized the trickery, it was too late. German sailors stormed the beaches and blew up a telegraph station. Now, Fanning Island was a key station in what the British called their all-red line. That is, it was a string of, of stations that spanned the world, east and west. They went all around the world with buried telegraph cables, and it kind of uh, kept the British Empire communicating. It kind of kept the British Empire together. Fanning Island lay south of Hawaii, and it connected Vancouver, so it connected Canada and Australia together. And the Germans cackled over their cleverness. There will be no one to stop us this time, Admiral von Spey declared. With the Germans gone, the British simply fixed the cable in two weeks. Oh! In any case, the Germans sunk some ships too. Daniels had booked his ticket on a Japanese steamship, but Japan had just declared war on Germany, so maybe that didn't seem like a good idea anymore. What's more, the German colonies in the Pacific were directly between Australia and Japan. Now, what Daniels didn't realize was that the German Pacific fleet had looked around when war was declared, realized that the Pacific wasn't exactly a friendly neighborhood. I mean, it wasn't exactly near Germany. So they made a beeline to South America. The attack on Fanning Island was a way of kind of covering their escape. Von Spee wrote, quote, I am quite homeless. I cannot reach Germany. We possess no other harbor. I must plow through the seas of the world doing as much mischief as as I can, end quote. Now, maybe we should do a World War podcast sometime. I don't know. I digress. Daniels resigned himself to India instead of sailing up to Japan and China. Sad to miss out on visiting the folks up there. He admitted that he didn't know whether he would make it to Europe now that war had broken out. So Daniels boarded this slow-ish ocean liner, the SS Austerlitz on his way to Sri Lanka and then India. Now, as Daniel sailed to India, his ship joined a convoy that had 30,000 fresh Anzac troops on their way to the Mediterranean. Anzac is Australia and New Zealand. They were supposed to go to France, these troops, but they were diverted when the Ottoman Empire joined Germany and Austro-Hungary. 
Now they were on their way to Egypt, ready to take down the Turks. They had no idea that they were being thrown into Winston Churchill's disastrous Gallipoli campaign, which cost the Anzac troops 38,000 casualties and nearly shipwrecked Churchill's career. If the troops didn't know what they were heading into, neither did Daniels. The only reason his ship joined this convoy was because of this deathly fear of one German ship that didn't head to South America, the Emden. These troops, these Australian and New Zealand troops, were supposed to have left in August, but they told the British, if you don't send us more escort ships, if you don't send us more warships, we're not even thinking of leaving. So we're staying put until then. So they were supposed to leave in August. By the time the British sent more ships, it was early November. In the meantime, between that time, the Emden, left on its own in the Indian Ocean, sunk or captured 23 Allied ships. Daniels' ship sailed close enough to the troop transports that they exchanged greetings, but were then sharply told to keep quiet. All lights, even cigarettes, were put out at night. They were told to take no pictures and write nothing of this in any letter for at least two weeks. Daniel said he kept the secret well. He said nothing about it, but three days after his ship joined the convoy, the lead warship in the convoy peeled off after the captain received word that the Emden was near. The HMAS Sydney took care of it. A cool side story is that just before the Emden was destroyed, the Emden had sent a raiding party out on this island to destroy another British telegraph station. Now that they were stranded because their ship was destroyed, they couldn't go back to it. Now that they were stranded, the men hijacked a ship that was on its way to Yemen, and then they hiked all the way across the desert to Constantinople or Istanbul before moving on to Berlin. It took them six months to get home. Anyway, when the Emden's captain was asked what he would have done if he had discovered that Anzac convoy, captain replied that he would have followed closely at night and at first light opened up on the troop transports with every gun and torpedo he had until either he was sunk or run out of ammo. If that were the case, if that captain would have discovered the convoy, then A.G. Daniels might have had a much shorter presidency. As it was, Daniels survived, surprise, somewhat oblivious to the danger that he had avoided. He arrived in India. India was eye-opening. The work there had started 20 years before and featured Anna Knight, the first black female missionary, who avoided the color line issue back in America by being in India during those years. Daniels traveled thousands of miles in India, visiting schools and workers. He was excited that not all the work here was confined to English-speaking Europeans, who were naturally the first group that Adventists could reach. He visited several villages near Afghanistan, where 50 people claimed to be Seventh-day Adventists. Upon closer inspection, they hardly knew what Adventists believed, but he visited them anyway. Daniels went on to Singapore and to Hong Kong, where he received word that the old General Conference President O.A. Olson had died. He also stopped to visit the grave of Abram LaRue, one of those wonderful self-appointed missionaries of the earlier days. From there, he went on to the Philippines, meeting with Adventist leaders who had gathered from across Asia. In this window, 12,000 Seventh-day Adventists had responsibility for one billion people in Asia. In the face of these odds, Daniels admitted that he had little desire to return to America, where the members were spoiled with so many pastors and so many institutions. He was needed in Asia, not in America. He loved seeing the innocent faith and determination of the missionaries, not the overfed complacency and complaining in the West. He didn't want to sit behind a desk. Well, from the Philippines, he went on to Japan at last, where Adventists were hard-pressed to advance. Japan was tough. 
government regulations made it harder for Christians to operate. Japan was changing, becoming more inward-looking, more traditional, more nationalistic. Surely this wasn't going to bode well in a few decades. From Japan, he went to Korea, and then back through Manchuria and into China, and finally, once again, to Hong Kong, where he then sailed for San Francisco. Speaking of the Filipinos in particular, but perhaps all the Asians in general, Daniel said, quote, I do not see how anyone with a warm Christian heart can help falling in love with these earnest people, end quote. Well, Daniels traveled tens of thousands of miles and spoke hundreds of times, but one particular topic was given on every continent he visited, the red-hot issue of the Eastern Question. Now, Avenus didn't invent this phrase. For 40 years at least, Western politics had debated the Eastern Question, which concerned what the West would do when the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey, falls. Who gets the spoils? How does this affect the balance of power in the region? Adventists had always had an interest in Turkey, even, even going back to the days of William Miller when Josiah Litch predicted the fall of Turkey. Now I'm going to say Turkey instead of the Ottoman Empire, which is more correct just simply because I think it's easier for my dear listeners, to imagine Turkey and, and that region of the world, and, and some of them may be wondering what in the world is the Ottoman Empire. All right, we're going to call it Turkey. By Turkey, I mean the Ottoman Empire. All right, great, got that down. So, anyways, the, the Millerites were even interested in the fate of Turkey. This was true when Uriah Smith picked up his pen many decades later. He expanded on this when he saw Turkey featuring prominently in Daniel 11 and in Revelation 9 and in Revelation 16. Avenus saw Turkey as the king of the north of Daniel 11, that, that final power holding back the tide of Armageddon. Turkey's involvement in World War I only heightened interest. Old Adventist sermons on Turkey's role in prophecy might have barely stirred anyone in 1890, but now it seemed to be of the utmost importance. Even non avenist newspapers were interested in Adventist articles about the subject, and people would come and ask Adventist evangelists or Adventist pastors to speak on the subject to their congregation. The Eastern Question was a pet subject for Daniels as well, who wrote over a dozen articles on it in the review. These articles methodically combed through historical sources to connect the vague verses of Daniel 11 to historical realities. In one article, Daniels carefully set up the number of ships and men that Napoleon and the Turks could muster in the 1790s. He concluded his article with this cliffhanger, quote, These great forces were all bent on crushing Napoleon. The result will be given in our next number. End quote. Meaning there's the next issue. You're going to have to wait a week to find out whether Napoleon survives. Daniels, tell us I don't want to wait another week. Does Napoleon win against the odds? Well, the series was postponed while Daniels went on his 15-month tour of the Pacific. The editors of the review notified their loyal readers that he would indeed continue the series when he got back, which might be a testament of how popular the series was. People were interested. So don't worry. In the meantime, there were always local evangelists who preached this message far and near. Turkey would fall. Armageddon would come. Jesus was almost here. Now, no one would say exactly when this would be. It wasn't as if the day after Turkey fell, Jesus would be here. They just recognized it as one of the last signs. I mean, the final verses of Daniel 11 talked about Turkey's fall. The first verse of chapter 12 talked about Jesus' second coming. It wasn't rocket science here. Back in the day, A.T. Jones wrote a whole book about it. He put it well when he basically said, just to paraphrase him, when will this happen and whether it will happen exactly as we predict? Well, these are great and interesting questions. People have studied them. But the real question is, 
What will happen when these things are accomplished? Daniel says that there will be such a time of trouble as the world had never seen before, with war beginning in Europe, war on a scale never seen before in human history. People were listening. Could this be Armageddon? Naturally, some Adventist preachers and writers and evangelists took it a little bit further. The Signs of the Times, right next to an ad for Standard Oil, gave a list of topics that signs was going to be covering in the near future. Topics like peace in the U.S. Navy, the price of war, the German crown prince, evolution, and of course, the Eastern Question. Uriah Smith, who of course died before he could see the Great War, wrote these lines on the Eastern Question in his commentary in Daniel and the Revelation. Quote, we have now traced the prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel step by step to this last verse. As we see the divine predictions meeting their fulfillment in history, our faith is strengthened in the final accomplishment of God's prophetic word. It is predicted of the king of the north that he shall come to his end. Here, Uriah Smith is quoting the Bible. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. Just how and when and where his end will come, we may watch with solemn interest. End quote. Now, trying to rein in some of the more, shall we say, enthusiastic ones among them, Adventist editors reminded people that World War I couldn't yet be Armageddon because the final plagues haven't fallen yet. Still, it was hard to restrain speculation and the excitement that they were witnessing prophecy being fulfilled before their very eyes. For decades, they had predicted that Turkey would fall, being abandoned by its allies. And now its allies were Germany and Austro-Hungary, seemingly invincible at the beginning of the war. Nevertheless, Adventists believe that one way or the other, the Ottoman Empire wouldn't survive this war. Adventists hadn't been this interested in the course of a war since the Civil War. But this was a global war. This was something new. And Adventists from all over the world were fascinated. Daniels, it seems, took his sermons, took his talks from his Pacific tour and turned them into a book which he published on the Eastern Question in 1917, toward the end of the war. Adventists, I should say, weren't the only Christians viewing World War I in apocalyptic terms. The Jehovah's Witnesses went further than the Adventists and declared that World War I was the beginning of Armageddon for sure. Some Adventists flirted with Armageddon language, but that was about as far as it went. What threw a wrench into Adventist interpretations of Daniel 11 was that the British beat up the Turks in Jerusalem. Now, that sounds like that should have given Adventists confidence, but Adventists actually were expecting the Turks to be first kicked out of their capital, Istanbul, which they would then move to Jerusalem because of how Daniel 11 is worded. As the war wound down, the Ottoman Empire was indeed neutered, although Turkey would survive, its territory carved up, largely by France and Britain, who distributed as they pleased. Oh, let's create a country called Syria. Ooh, let's call this one Palestine and invite the Jews to emigrate. I'm sure nothing bad will come from all this meddling in the Middle East. <clears throat> Some Avenus pressed on, saying that despite the setback to their precise vision, somehow the Turks would come back, occupy Jerusalem, and then be destroyed again. But it was clear that the air was out of the tire. Baptism rates had soared toward the end of the war, and these articles on the Eastern Question were in high demand and debated by educated people. Now it was like, what do we do? Some Adventist editors focused on the nascent Zionist movement, others focused on the new League of Nations, others focused on the rise of communism, they were just trying to recapture some of the public's attention, which they had during the war, 
And the, the modern political landscape was all new. It was difficult to know which of these things was worth watching, which of these things might be related to a fulfillment of prophecy. The consensus on the Eastern question after the war was ultimately that the prophecy was still true, but we didn't know how and when it will be fulfilled. We just know that prophecy cannot fail. And many Adventists did what they do best since 1844. They went back to the Bible, they reread Daniel 11, they revisited their interpretation and concluded that Turkey wasn't at all the king of the north in Daniel 11. And so these Adventists went back to James White's old interpretation that the king of the north was, in fact, the papacy. So James and Uriah Smith actually had had disagreements about this subject, but with James dying young, so to speak, it was Uriah's view that gained acceptance in the church, Uriah's view that, that Turkey was being talked about here. After World War I, and especially World War II, James White's view that the King of the North was the papacy came back into fashion and has reigned until recently, let's say, until maybe around 9-11, which for some reason got Adventists thinking about the Muslim world again. Daniels, even while he held on to the Turkey interpretation of Daniel 11, would, I think, memorably go on to call the Eastern question, quote, old, complicated, and never-ending, end quote. You might wonder what Ellen White thought about the Eastern question. She didn't. When that phrase appears in her writings, it is because she noted that Uriah Smith or Daniels was preaching about it. She doesn't utter one word of interest or disinterest in the subject itself. She just noted that people were talking about it. Ellen White hasn't had much to say about, well, much in the past few episodes. When Daniels found her before his trip to Asia, he found her on one of her good days. She was mostly aloof from the details of church government. She spent much of her time finishing some books. But if you wanted to get to her, if you wanted to get in touch with her, you wrote to Willie. He was her guardian now. He decided which messages he was going to pass on to his mom and which he wasn't going to trouble her with. Which gets us thinking, guys, Ellen White isn't doing well at all. I think it's time we packed up and went to go check on her one last time.